to market, and uh, we're excited to bring those products to you and your customers. And so today we have Jake Bailey, who is going to do our webinar. Jake is the Director of Product and Sales Support here at the Milner Group. He's been with us for about eight years now, and uh, Jake has a degree in finance. So, uh, Jake, take it away. Thanks, Greg. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to be on the call today. Uh, my goal today is to give you information um, that will help you grow your business and information, hopefully, to help you beat your competition. Specifically, though, we're going to cover how life insurance fits into a well-rounded retirement plan. So let's get into it. What are we going to cover today? First topic is going to be, does life insurance make sense in a retirement plan? I think this is a valid question. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you listen to uh, so-called financial gurus, especially on the radio, uh, life insurance really gets a bad name as far as uh, cash value accumulation goes. Using it in a retirement plan, uh, typically, uh, you know, people would think of you as somebody who's just trying to make money by pushing a product uh, that doesn't really fit. Or maybe you just don't know uh, what's available and you're just pushing the only thing you know. That's kind of the sense you get. Um, but as we go through this today, I want to uh, show you that you should not be ashamed to show life insurance as part of a retirement plan. I really think that it does have a valid place. Uh, we're also going to cover how does index universal life work, go through a little bit of the mechanics, not too much in depth, but just to give you an idea. Uh, really of what differentiates index GL from other products. We're going to look at what a typical case design would look like. How would you set up uh, a universal life, an index universal life product optimally uh, to make it fit into a retirement plan? And then finally, I'll uh, mention some hot products. Uh, what I see right now as products that are going to be tough to beat. All right, so when you look at uh, financial goals at retirement, um, you're looking at money. It's going to be a big factor, obviously. How much money can you get? How much money do you need? Um, and you know that, that could be, obviously, you want to accumulate as much as possible, but a reasonable, uh, usual goal would be, I would like to retain my current standard of living in retirement and maybe leave some money for my kids. Uh, obviously, at retirement, you want to minimize risk, and you always want to minimize taxes. So as much money as possible, as little risk, and as uh, little taxation as possible. So as the financial advisor, how do you fit into this? What does your client expect you to do? As far as the money is concerned, your main goal is to tell them how to make their money work for them, right? So in other words, where do I invest it? And then... Once they've invested it, how, and once they've made it, how do they keep it? So that's really the reducing risk and the reducing taxation part. So when you think about the typical retirement income sources, what comes to mind? There's several things that are immediately going to come to your mind. Social Security is a big one for most people. Um, 401k plans, IRAs, both traditional and Roth, uh, mutual funds, CDs and bonds, annuities. Uh, you know, cash, you might have somebody who's really risk averse that's holding a lot of uh, cash and not really investing it well. However, what about life insurance? How is that going to fit in? I think to start that conversation, we should talk about uh, how taxation fits into retirement. And I really see uh, there's really three main categories of taxation that all these investments uh, can be broken down into. First category is taxable. This is uh, this is the worst one to be in, the worst bucket to be in. Um, this is the one you'd like to avoid. Typically, uh, this is going to be your most liquid uh, sort of investment, uh, and it, but it you know it doesn't have any tax advantages. You get taxed on the money when you make it, on the seed so to speak, and you get taxed again on your growth um, when you make any sort of gain. So non-qualified plans, there's there's no tax advantages. Then there's tax-deferred accounts. This is what most people uh, think of as qualified uh, plans, you know, the typical retirement plan. You're going to get taxed on the uh, harvest instead of the seed. So this would be your traditional 
IRA, your 401k plans generally. So you're going to be taxed on all your gain, but you put in tax-free money. So that, that's a real big benefit you're given there. And then uh, the category that's often called tax-free, I'm going to call it tax-first because I think it makes more sense that way. Um, this is where you're taxed on the seed, in other words, the money you make, instead of the harvest. So this would be accumulation that is tax-deferred and also uh, money in retirement when you take out distributions that is tax-free. All right, so what fits into these different categories? Taxable accounts, okay. This would be, like I said, things that are usually a little bit more liquid, um, you know, CDs and bonds, money market accounts. Um, these are going to be taxable when you make the money. They're going to be taxable when you make money on your money. Okay, no real benefits here. Tax deferred accounts, 401k, traditional IRAs, and uh, some people don't know this, but Social Security, um, you know, potentially up to 85% of Social Security uh, can be taxable uh, when you start receiving it. And I think the current, uh, you know, if you're filing uh, married, you're filing jointly, uh, I think that limit right now is 44000 of income. So you can see it's pretty easy to get into the, uh, to where you're going to have taxation on your Social Security. And then there's the tax first accounts, the, the ones where you are taxed on your income, but the growth and the um, distributions are tax free. This is a good bucket to be in. Municipal bonds, um, <clears throat> this is a really conservative strategy. Um, you're going to have really low yields, of course, really really low risk, but because it's so low of a yield, you're really just using that as an inflation hedge, uh, a very low return on that. Not really going to get you much closer to retirement. Roth IRAs, of course, uh, you're going to have market yields. Um, the problem with uh, Roth IRAs is that you have fairly low contribution limits. If you're under 50 right now, it's 5500 a year. Over 50, you have a $1,000 uh, catch-up provision, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> but there's also income limits. It gets phased out. Um, if you're, you have a wealthier client, they can't make contributions to this anyway. It's not really an option for them. And then another tax-first account is life insurance. You have several investment accounts available, of course, depending on what kind of product you get. Um, one of the key features here that is nice about life insurance is there's no contribution limits. Of course, you have to qualify in financial underwriting. Not usually an issue for this type of sale. Um, and then, of course, there's you don't want to have a mech. But uh, other than that, there's really not contribution limits. So it's very, very flexible what you can put into it. So when we think about income taxation in the future, uh, we're thinking about what really is going to be affecting somebody when they come to retirement. Do we think that income taxation is going to be, excuse me, is it going to be higher, lower, or static? Most times when you ask that question right now, people are going to say, I think it's going to be higher. Okay? Given that, how should we plan what buckets your tax uh, money should be in? Well, taxable and tax deferred accounts, they're going to make your clients vulnerable to higher tax rates in the future because you're going to have taxation when you take the money out in retirement. Tax-first accounts, however, lock in today's historically low tax rates. Um, so we are in historically low uh, tax rates right now. So it would be nice to be able to lock that in and not worry about what taxes are going to go to in the future so much. And I would argue that it's difficult to plan effectively for retirement when you have no idea how much you're going to pay in taxes. So a lot of your money is in uh, tax-deferred or taxable accounts where um, whatever happens in taxation is going to seriously affect the net amount of money you have in retirement. So what are the benefits of life insurance? Where does it fit in? Um, well, the government, the IRS has actually given life insurance a lot of really big tax benefits. You have tax-deferred accumulation. You have tax-free distributions. If you loan money out and you don't lapse the policy, you can take the money out tax-free. Tax predictability, uh, what I mean by that is that you don't really have to worry about what tax rates are in the future since you're loaning money out and you're not taxed on it. You don't have contribution limits or phase-outs. You don't have RMDs. Um, 
index universal life products, almost all of them offer a 0% floor. So once you've made money, you're not going to have a negative return on that money. You might have years where you don't make any more, but you are not having years where you have a negative return. There's a lot of security there. There's a self-completing death benefit. Let's not forget, this is, uh, this is life insurance. So <clears throat> wouldn't you be able to like to tell your client, you can have tax-deferred accumulation, tax-free distributions, you don't have any contribution limits, you don't have to take money out if you don't want to, you're not going to lose money once you've made it, hey, and if you don't live long enough to make as much money as you expected, you get a death benefit immediately. It completes itself. And that death benefit passes tax-free to your heirs. There really are a lot of benefits to life insurance. Let's look at an example of how an index universal life would, uh, would work, how we could set it up, and what are some real numbers. I just ran this yesterday. These are current numbers. Male age 45, typical client. Uh, he's got $25,000 a year. That's kind of a lot. You could do a good bit less and still make this look really good. But I just picked these numbers. Uh, he's going to pay it through age 65, and he's a preferred risk. Okay, um, We're going to solve for the minimum non-MEC death benefit. So we're minimizing the death benefit portion to maximize our cash value accumulation. Okay, We're going to set our interest assumption, our accumulation assumption, to 6%. We'll talk about why 6% in a little bit. We're going to do an option two to one switch at 65. What does that mean? That means we're going to have an option two, in other words, an increasing death benefit for the first 20 years while we're funding it. Then we're going to switch it to an option one. What does that do? It allows us to further minimize the death benefit without creating a mech during our accumulation phase. Um, and then we switch it to an option one uh, when we start taking distributions because that reduces the cost even further. Okay. And then we're going to solve for max disbursements um, at age 66 and onward, uh, such that the policy does not lapse. We're going to use WASH loans, and we'll talk more about WASH loans later. What's the result of this setup? $58,000 annual tax-free income through age 100, so basically for the rest of your life. All right, pretty strong. And that's with North American's Builder IUL 7. That's a great product. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. I wanted to compare this. When I saw how good this was, I wanted to compare this to uh, a what if. What if you were investing that money in a mutual fund? Would we be able to stand up against that, or we have to hang our heads and be ashamed for what we just showed? Okay. So on the left hand, I've got um, you know like a retirement target mutual fund. So um, I'm trying to make this very a competitive fund. I've got, uh, as you can see at the top here, I've put no loads on it. I've got a 0.8% management fee. So pretty reasonable there. All right. And then since it's a retirement target fund. I've got our rate of return diminishing, as you can see on the right-hand side here, diminishing over time. So that's really just trying to, uh, to show what a, a fund manager might be moving funds around to make you, uh, have a less, make you in a less risky position as you get to retirement. So I think this is fairly realistic. So this is the same thing. We've got $25,000 going into this a year. We've got $58,000 coming out net. Okay, And then what happens? You can see during the green period here, we are taking money out, and okay, we get basically 20 years of distributions, and then we've exhausted our money. All right, so I think that's a pretty reasonable uh, expectation of what could happen there. Um, this is affected, of course, by taxation, which I've taken that into account at 20%, uh, which would be your capital gains rate right now. All right, so this is a reasonable assumption of what would happen in a mutual fund. On the right hand side, we've got the same North American illustration we just talked about. What can we do there? Same funding. All right, we're assuming 6%. We're doing wash loans. And okay, you can take out that 58,000. It continues to go all the way for life. I didn't have room to show that, but it continues to go all the way for life, and it's tax-free. All right, so this, is, this stands up really strong. All right, and we're backing down our interest assumptions. And I'm going to talk about why we chose 6%, and I'm going to talk about wash loans as well. All right, so this really does uh, stack up. The only downside I would see here um, is that with the mutual fund, obviously you're more liquid initially, and that's that's going to be a major um, a major point that might come up um, in usual discussion about this. You can see, you know, you've immediately got 
um, access to your money in the mutual fund. You, you're, um, you don't have any, um, any large uh, fees like you would for surrendering a policy early for life insurance. But once you get into you know, 20 years or so, that's totally uh, gone away. Okay, and the products start to stand up against each other. So obviously, life insurance, is, I would say, is a long-term play. It really is. You know, you got to be in it for at least 15 years before you start taking money out. So you don't want to just sell one of these and expect to turn it around immediately. You really want to have a reasonable expectation of time. Okay. So now that we've established that life insurance really does have a lot of benefits in a retirement plan, um, and indexed UL looks good. How does it work? Okay, what are the different life insurance accounts that are available, first of all? There's the general account of the insurance company. All right, current assumption ULs are all in this, um, and this is typically invested heavily in high-grade long-term bonds. All right, low risk, a lot of predictability, uh, not a really high return. Typically right now, uh, the return that actually passes through uh, in an insurance product, a current assumption is going to be 4% or less. Okay. Uh, mutual funds are another life insurance account. Obviously, this would be the variable product. We don't sell variable products, but I'm just bringing this up because uh, it is a possibility for some people. This is going to offer more of a market rate of return, and negative returns are possible. So that's kind of a big downside in that one. You could have huge negative returns. All right, and then there's stock index accounts. This is what an index universal life uses. Um, I want to talk about a little bit what our expected rate of return would be uh, and how the 0% floor really factors into this. Uh, it really gives us a, um, a stability. All right, so let's look at indexed accounts and how they work. So what is an indexed account? I like to describe it as an option leveraged general account. Okay, and I'll go over that in just a second. Um, you have a floor. So, like I said, 0% typically, you're not going to have negative returns. You have a cap. That's the other side of it. You're going to not earn more than the cap. So that's typically somewhere around 12%, 13% in a competitive product. So any returns that the S&P 500 does, if that's the index account you're in that are above the cap of 13%, you don't participate in that, okay? So in a 20% year, you made 13%. But in a negative 20% year, you made zero, okay? Participation rates is the other factor. Typically, in the, most of the products we sell, it's 100%. All right, so that doesn't really come into account. You get 100% of what the S&P does between zero and the cap. The cap and the participation rate is controlled by the insurer. So those things, uh, a lot of times the participation rate is guaranteed, but pretty much always the cap can move. All right, so we'll talk about why that would be. Um, Okay, choice of stock indexes, typically S&P 500 is what's used, but there are multiple accounts available in almost every product now. Okay, so how does that cap and floor work? I think that's important to understand because um, the cap can move. The floor typically is guaranteed, but the cap can move. And so we need to be aware of that uh, to set reasonable expectations for a product. So basically, you pay your premium to the insurer, they're going to deduct the mortality and expense charges. They're going to invest what's left in their general account. Remember, long-term bonds, low return, they're typically about 5% is what the company is earning. They're going to take those general account earnings, and they're going to use that to determine their options budget. They're going to purchase options from an investment bank. So you can see higher general account earnings equals a potentially higher cap. All right, let's look at an actual example with numbers to make this kind of stand out a little bit more. Let's assume you have a $1,200 premium for your life insurance policy. It's your index UL. Let's say the mortality and expense charges are $200 for that year. You've got a $1,000 net premium that gets invested in the general account. The company knows they're going to earn about 5%, so they have $50 to purchase options. They're going to call the investment bank. Um, and they're going to say, you know, what can we purchase for $50? And they're going to say, well, you got the 0% floor, and we're going to give you a 12% cap. And behind the scenes, the investment bank is buying and selling options, okay? This is subject to market fluctuation over time. So the, um, you can see that if the uh, insurance company's general account returns went down, they might have to lower the cap. If their 
returns went up, they could raise the cap. Um, also, if the prices of options changed, that could change what they could do. So far, we've seen um, for several years now, um, caps stay pretty close, 12, 13 percent. I've seen companies lower them, and I've seen companies raise them. But typically, it's very small increments that they make changes in. OK, so now that you have a general idea of how that works, how are we going to design a case to maximize income for your client? A little bit of important terminology here real quick. MEC, Modified Endowment Contract, basically we have to avoid it. All right, It strips all the tax privileges. OK, so really what that means is we can't fund a policy too quickly. We have to generally fund it over a period of time. Uh, the quickest you can usually fund something to look good is seven years. And that's not surprising because it's a seven-pay test. So that's how that works. So we, we take care of that for you behind the scenes. Uh, withdrawals versus loans, this is important. We'll talk about it. Typically, when you're taking money out of a contract, we'll withdraw the basis. So you withdraw all the money you put in, basically, because that's tax-free. That comes back to you tax-free. And then you start loaning. And that, that allows you to avoid taxation on the gain that you have. Fixed versus variable loans goes hand in hand with wash versus arbitrage loans. It's really just different terminology. I am a big fan of the fixed loan, AKA wash loan provision um, for taking money out of a contract. Basically, um, you don't, you're not going to earn any money on what you've taken out, but you're not going to be uh, losing money on what you've taken out. Okay, so basically the way it works typically is they guarantee you that loaned out money is going to earn three percent and they guarantee you that they won't charge you more than 3%. So you're going to have a wash uh, on everything that's loaned out. This is a safe sort of bet because everything is guaranteed. However, you're going to be in competitive situations where an agent is showing variable loans, AKA arbitrage loans. I think this is really risky and goes against typical uh, retirement strategy because it retains a lot of risk in retirement. What this does is it says, okay, Everything you loan out, we're going to continue to credit you whatever you're earning in that um, indexed account. But we're going to charge you a variable rate of loan, a uh, variable loan rate. So you might be showing somebody an 8% return in the index, which is really high, but a lot of people show that. Uh, but you also might be showing them a 5% variable loan. So what have you just done? You've projected an income stream for them that's based on them earning an arbitrage of 3% on everything that's loaned out. So it looks great, of course, but it's really risky. So I, I, I don't ever show that, but except to compare it to what somebody else has shown. Um, so just be aware that that is something that is out there and is definitely being shown, but it retains a lot of risk for the client. So what are our funding and distribution goals when we set up an index product? We, of course, want to maximize income. We want to minimize risk. And we have to prevent a lapse of the policy. If an insurance policy lapses and you've taken loans out on the gain, you immediately are going to get a tax bill, regular income tax, for the amount of the gain that you have loaned out. So you really need to prevent a lapse. OK, so how do we meet these goals? How do we get the maximum income out of, out of a product? Here's a tip. I, I would recommend, instead of talking about death benefit, like you normally would with a client, start with the premium. Because death benefit is really something we're going to take care of for you. All right, we're going to minimize it. So discuss a funding goal. So what is it? Is it $1,000 a month, $500 a month? What is it? What are you willing to, uh, to uh, look at for putting into this policy? OK, we're going to take that, and then we're going to put that money into a contract and minimize the death benefit while avoiding a mech. And we're going to do, you know, a lot of times an option to switch to even further make that look uh, really good. How are you going to minimize risk? I would suggest using a reasonable interest crediting rate, first of all. Most companies use a back testing method to show you what they're going to allow you to credit. And I'll talk about that in a second. But typically, an index product with a 13% cap, they're going to let you show about 8%. I think that is really high and unreasonable. And if you use that as your crediting rate, you're going to be setting some unreasonable expectations. So you're not minimizing risk, basically. And then as we discussed, use a wash loan. Okay? Um, don't introduce extra risk into the retirement phase. And then, obviously, preventing a lapse. Well. This gives you a good opportunity to do policy reviews. I don't 
think that IndexQL in retirement is a um, is a product that you sell and forget about. Okay, and that that can be a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it's a good thing because it gives you a real reason to do policy reviews with your client and get back in front of them. You can call them and say, hey, did you know that we earned 8% this year in your index product? I want to talk to you about the options you've got and what we'd like to do going forward. It gives you new opportunities to get in front of your client. Overloan protection. Just be aware that some products actually have an overloan protection rider. What that does, basically, is if you're not managing a policy and the client maybe is taking out more than they should based on how the product is, uh, how it's earning money, they, um, the company can automatically come in, stop uh, any more money from coming out, reduce the face amount, put the money, the, put the policy in paid up mode, and guarantee you that it's not going to lapse. Okay, to keep you from getting that large tax bill that you could get if you lapsed a policy after loaning a lot out. That's available. Just be aware of it. So we've talked a lot about that 6% interest rate. Did we just pull that out of the sky? Uh, no, I think that that's a pretty reasonable number, uh, and we put some thought into it. How does an insurance company do it, though? How do they tell you uh, what you're supposed to, uh, what they expect you to illustrate? Well, they back test basically in a vacuum, and they don't uh, take any variables into consideration. So they're going to say, what would our product have earned in the S&P 500 over the past 20 or 30 years? They're going to look at actual numbers. They're going to apply their cap and their floor to it, and then they're going to say, you know what, we would have earned 8%. The problem there is they don't take into account that, hey, our cap could have moved. We could have moved that. We might have had to move it. Um, do, do we really think everything's going to stay the same and there's going to be no fluctuation? So they kind of give you a little bit of an unrealistic expectation there. I think it's more appropriate to look at what's actually happening behind the scenes. What I do is, is assume a small risk premium, so to speak, for swapping bond returns for the option returns in the contract. So like I said, they're taking those general account returns and they're buying options. So really what they're doing, the insurance company is not taking any risk, not any extra risk, just the mortality risk like normal, but they're shifting um, that general account return for the potential for a much higher return in the stock market. So they're shifting that risk to you. I, so I think that if the general account is earning 5%, then potentially 100, up to 100 basis point risk premium could give you a 6% index UL rate. So for the additional risk the client's taking, they should expect a little bit of additional return, theoretically. I would not illustrate more than 6%. That's generally as high as I go on that. This is a really neat tool right here. Um, this is John Hancock ha is big into index UL products. And they have put a lot of work into this tool. This is an online tool that any of you can go use, or you can call me and I'll, I'll use it for you. Um, basically, it's, uh, the website, if you want to write it down, is iultranslate.com. That's iultranslate.com. No passwords required. You can get on there um, and, and go ahead and check this out for yourself. What John Hancock has attempted to do, and you can see that uh, at the bottom side here, there's a marketing library. They give you information on how they came up with this tool. They really went very deep into uh, options pricing strategy, uh, financial, basically how financial theory in the market, um, how, and what they're trying to do is show you um, what's a reasonable return and how to compare products to each other. That's a big problem. How do we compare products that have different costs and different caps and all that? Uh, well, they've gone to a lot of trouble, and I think this tool is extremely useful. You, there's also an option here at the bottom for a client presentation, which is pretty cool. But what they do is, and the, the way you use this, the first thing here is your equity assumption. That is what you think is reasonable over time to earn in the S&P 500, okay? So 8%. If you back test the market, then that's a pretty reasonable assumption right there. All right, and then you put in the participation rate of the company, 100% typically, put in the floor, 0% typically, and you put in the cap. And here I've got 12% in. And it tells you, okay, based on all of that, going through all of our calculations, we think that 6.1% is reasonable uh, expectation of what you can earn in an index product. That in itself is cool, but it also allows you to compare products. So I've, so I've got a 6.1% for this 12% cap product. If I put in a 10% cap, it tell, it's going to tell me something like 5.5% is reasonable. 
So I would run the 10% cap product at five and a half, and the 12% cap product somewhere around six, and then that really gives me uh, a starting point to compare the products. Because a lot of times you'll find that a product with a low cap has lower costs in it, and of course it does because it was less expensive to buy that lower cap. If you just compare everybody at the same interest rate, those products are going to shine. But was it really realistic to show that higher interest rate with the low cap product? And I would argue no. So this tool really helps us compare products. OK, so finishing up here, what are some hot products right now? Um, the one, obviously, I used in my example, of course, is a hot one, North American. They have some great index UL products. They have really good growth-oriented ones, and they also have an index UL that has a lifetime, up to a lifetime guarantee on it. So if you've got a client that still wants those lifetime guarantees but wants some growth, they've got a great product for it. AXA's got a really good accumulation product, very low-cost product, a little bit lower cap. John Hancock, like I mentioned, Minnesota Life, National Life, all these companies are really good. Okay. Um, and National Life has a really neat feature I'm going to tell you about here. Um, but these are great products, and we keep on top of it for you. I just want to show you this. We can run reports like this very quickly. So for your particular scenario, we can say, you know what? We, we automatically know that these, this carrier, this carrier, and this carrier are going to be the best. Okay? We know that you're in a competitive situation, and we're going to find that best product for you. So we've got the tools to do that. I want to talk about one neat rider right before I finish up here. Um, there is an income rider that National Life has that can eliminate market risk in the retirement phase. It's really neat. They call it the lifetime income benefit rider. Basically what this does is it says, okay, your accumulation phase is not guaranteed. Of course it's not. Uh, you'll, you'll earn whatever the index does. But once you get to the point where you want to switch on that lifetime income, we will guarantee the amount you get for life. Okay? They actually guarantee the percentage of what you've accumulated that they'll give you for life. So you can go ahead and talk to your client like this. You can say, all right, uh, I think a reasonable expectation is this interest rate. And based on this funding level, you should get to, let's say, a million dollars by retirement, just to make the calculation easy in my head. You've got to a million dollars at retirement. Well, National Life, based on this funding, is going to guarantee you that they'll pay you 6.8% tax-free per life based on whatever you've gotten to accumulation-wise. So I can say, you've accumulated a million dollars. If you do that, they'll pay you $68,000 a year for the rest of your life, however long you live, tax-free, and your policy is not going to lapse. All right? This is really cool. And National Life has this rider. They have a really good index product. And feel free to call me about it. And I'd love to go through it and you know, tell you how it works, give you an illustration. All right, that pretty much finishes it up for me. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'm not sure if Greg mentioned this, but there's a little message box in the bottom right hand of your screen that you can actually type in questions. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in there, and Dwayne can read them to me so I can answer them. Um, Dwayne, do we have any questions at this time? Yes, I do have one up here. Uh, has Does it make sense to use a surrogate insured child for this on older folks? Okay, so I think the the gist of that question is, does it make sense to put the insurance on somebody else so that you can minimize um, the insurance cost, the cost of the product? Um, I think that you're going to run into financial justification problems there. So here's what I would say. The actual cost of insurance, we're minimizing that already by minimizing the death benefit. Um, and so the actual underwriting class and the age of the person doesn't make as much difference as it does in, say, term insurance or just a death benefit sale. Um, so I think that, uh, there, yeah, there might be situations where maybe you'll put it on your wife because she's healthier than you uh, and the cost of insurance is a little bit lower than her. But I think as far as putting it on children, you're going to run into uh, financial underwriting issues. In other words, you know, why are you doing this? I don't think you uh, really have the justification, probably what the underwriter is going to say. Okay. Um, I, the other one I have here, I basically have a few for wanting recordings. Uh, just to let you know we are recording this, so uh, we will be able to send this out to you uh, after it's prepped. 
the next one on here, how about minimizing cost of insurance in an ISUL? Okay, so an indexed SUL contract? <clears throat> Correct. Um, yeah, um, you can, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. You can minimize, um, you minimize the cost of insurance by minimizing the death benefit, or the other way to think about it is maximizing the premium you put in without creating a MEC. Um, and I think the question really is getting at the fact that um, an index product, I mean, a survivorship product typically has a little bit lower cost of insurance because it doesn't pay the death benefit until both people have passed away, so the company's taking less risk. I would say, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. However, what I will say is, although index SUL products exist, they typically are not, uh, they haven't been designed as competitively yet as the products for single life. So it's a good idea theoretically. I don't think that the uh, best products have been designed for that yet, though. Uh, typically, uh, Minnesota Life has a good one. Um, and what I've seen with that is that really what it does is it gives you a good guaranteed death benefit with an option to get out of it in the future. That's what the index account does for you. But as far as maximizing income for retirement, I think right now it's geared towards single life products. Okay. Let's see. What about clients that are over 65 and healthy? Um, <laughs> what I would say is, um, is, you know, they've kind of missed the train if, if they're not, if they don't have an index product funded by then. Um, I think the latest you really probably want to start one of these is maybe 55. And, that, and, and assuming that, you're going to take retirement a little bit late. Okay, You might take uh, income at 70 or 75. At that point, you're really using it as a supplement to your, uh, only a supplement to additional plans, which is pretty much the case anyway. But um, the ideal age to start this is going to be probably 45, 50, or before. Uh, because like I said, Life insurance is a long-term plan. It's a long-term strategy. You want to give it at least 15 to 20 years, ideally. Could you do it at 65? Yes, but you probably wouldn't want to take out income until 85. So uh, it would be a whole different sale at that point. Explain the option to one switch. Option two to one switch. Option two is increasing death benefit. In other words, your death benefit is increased by the cash value in the contract. So Doing an op starting with option two allows you to um, to lower the death benefit even further for the same premium payment, um, and that's because of how the seven pay test works. It's it's pretty complicated, but basically all we need to know is that it allows us to put in more money for the same amount of death benefit, um, and thus further re reduce the cost of insurance. However, when you get to the point where you've stopped putting money in, you don't want it to be option two anymore. You want to switch it to an option one, meaning back to a level death benefit. Um, and that's when you're going to start taking money out. Switching it to an option one decreases the cost of the insurance in retirement. So if you're, there's no point in keeping that option two once you're taking money out because your death benefit's going down, your cash value's going down, there's no point in having an option two. So it's just a way for us to put more money in without creating a modified endowment contract. See, do these IUL products also have living benefit riders? Good question. Some of them do. Uh, living benefit riders are really popular. Um, however, I personally am not a proponent of bundling everything together. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to, to do this sort of sale that we've been talking about. In other words, the retirement supplement sale. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to bundle that with living benefits. If it's on there for free, fine, but you think about it this way. You're trying to accumulate as much cash as you can. Um, if you were to take money out for a long-term care claim uh, out of the policy, it's going to reduce your death benefit. And typically, once you when you reduce death benefit, your cash value is reduced proportionately. And taking that money out really is going to kill the retirement plan that you had. Um, so I think it makes a lot more sense to do it this way. Do fund this policy as best you can for retirement for income, and then get a different policy, as cheap as possible, a term for life guaranteed GVL type contract, and put a long-term care rider on that. Because if you need the long-term care, 
benefits, that product is designed much better to handle that, in my opinion, um, and you haven't paid for a bunch of cash value that you're not going to be able to use because you're, it's coming out of long-term care. So I think it's better to separate those two needs. All right, now I believe that's all the questions we have for today. Great. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that, uh, that came out today. We're planning on doing a webinar once a month for at least the first half of this year. I want all of these to be helpful to you in your business uh, and not just filled with uh, fluff. So I, I would appreciate uh, any feedback you have. And uh, we will be sending out uh, emails about our future webinars. Thank you very much. <laughs>